Well, I, I, I have uh, rules uh, for my wife, all right, because right, she's not here, so I can say what I want to say. You know? <laughs> <laughs> because there are times when she posts things online that I don't know about. So she'll post she got a promotion online. Oh, no. Before, yeah, like, I'm, everyone else said congratulations. I was like, oh, you got a promotion? I didn't, that would have been nice to know personally. You know, um, or, or I'll be honest, I'm, I'm going to be transparent. I was like, man, you know, the last 15 pictures, like, can I get it one? I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying, I mean, man, you liking everyone else. You didn't like my last five pictures. <laughs> but those are the things that, you know, from doing a lot of premarital counseling, we have to talk to couples about because there are, there are rules. And if we're not proactive, just like in your business, if you're not proactive in managing your brand and having a, a strategy of what you're putting out there, you can put the wrong thing out there and not, not know how you're coming off. And also as an entrepreneur, there are times in which people tell me I don't post enough, you know, because I'm inconsistent. They want to see me posting every day. If I want to be a source, I have to post every day or every three days, not just one, hey, hey, buy something. Hey, how you doing? You know, there has to be a relationship. So, so that makes sense. That makes sense. All right. So let's talk about, let's talk about. Uh, the workplace and advancing professionally because you all have been in uh, different corporate environments, entrepreneur environments. What should, what's one of the things that you see people do to limit their environment when they work in corporate America or in entrepreneurship? What are some limiters that people place in themselves, things that they do that keep them from elevating? Darren? Um, I guess one thing that I see in, in our office environment is just individuals that, uh, you know, they're just in, in their shell in their work environment. And, you know, you, you come to work and you perform your, your job and, and you go home. And, and that, that's fine, you know, for, for a lot of people if that's what they want to do. But what I see, you know, in the need for career advancement is that, you know, you need to, you need to open up. You need to be able to um, go from one department to the next and, and build relationships in those departments. We, we have a program at our firm called Launch uh, for newly college grads. And basically what that program is, is a, you know, once new hires come on, it's more of like a, a social club for the new hires. And they get together all around the, the country. They, they meet up in Chicago and they just build r rapport with one another. And they're all in, in different areas, different arenas. And, you know, and the Launch program is to groom future leaders of the organization because that's what the organization uh, put the program in place. And so you go from the internship to launch. And you know, that, that's really the culture that the organization wants you know, when it comes to promotions and those things. They want you to not just know about your space, but have an idea of, of how you know, environmental works and know who the go-to people are on our employee benefit side and who handles executive benefits and who are the key personnel there. And, you know, even if just having a conversation with them, understanding how uh, their job function works. And I think, you know, I think one of the things that, that really uh, prohibits a lot of individuals is, is if, you know, they get in that environment and they're just, they perform their tasks, which that's what they're getting paid to do. That's their job, you know, but not, um, you know, basically widening out to other organizations, other, your other internal team members and helping the organization grow. I think is, is one thing that, that stifles individuals in, in their career. So, and I think one, one thing that may prohibit that, you know, especially, you know, if, if we're in a big corporate environment, you know, as African Americans, you know, we don't always, um, you know, there, there are some, some cultural differences, right, with the majority. There's some, you know, but it's, it's, it's not insurmountable. You know, sometimes, you know, after work, go, go to that country music concert. <laughs> You know, spend some time, you know, doing different things. Go play bocce ball and, you know, all the games that you're probably not that interested in too. But, yeah, but, but, they, but, you know, once you build that rapport with the other individuals, you know, it becomes more inclusive. You know, then you can have, you know, other conversations that you may want to have with them and, and build a better rapport and relationship. And then, you know, that'll help, you know, push along your, your career, being no, able to do that. I think that's good, and I want you all to jump on this because let's talk about the actual strategy. I think uh, people realize, hey, I need to network, I need to meet as many different people as possible in this organization, not only at the organization, but in line, in, online in my space. But how do you do that? Give us some actual strategies 
but how to network across um, job lines. Yeah, I, I was actually going to to build on 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 that point. Um, I think one way to introduce yourself into new circles in work and also to better build those relationships. Um, one of the best pieces of advice that I've ever gotten from leadership was to be vulnerable. Um, I think it's difficult in a lot of the spaces that we're in because we may not have those connections because of different social barriers, what have you to really de build a good foundation of relationship and help people to understand how they can help you to achieve your goals. One of the, the biggest transition points that I've, I've had in my career was being honest and vulnerable with my manager about what direction I wanted to go in and it wasn't in my current role. I didn't want to progress and advance in, in sales. Um, it wasn't something that I saw for myself. And so I had to find a way to, to be very strategic and mindful about positioning that to him. Um, but once we developed that rapport, we built that relationship, I let him know that um, developing talent and developing diversity in the tech and especially in the engineering space was something that I was more passionate about. Um, being very thoughtful about how I positioned that to him, he opened the doors for me to meet other leaders in that area. He uh, informed me of some other side projects that I might be able to work on outside of my normal work hours that would introduce me to air people of influence. Um, that I could get some rapport with so I could get some visibility into my area of knowledge uh, in, in talent and in engineering. Um, so being vulnerable has been really impactful in my ability to cross chasms and to be in new spaces and in new circles of influence to uh, get into a, a trajectory that is more in alignment with what I'm passionate about. I think that's good. And I'll, I'll, I'll say two things and just to kind of piggyback on everything that you said. Number one is exposure. And for me, exposure is so important because we get so comfortable in our routines. I mean, I bet you you can tell me exactly how you drive home every single day, blindfolded. You take the same route, go to the same place, you probably see the same people even going home in the same cars and probably wave to them by now because you leave at the same time from work. So I think that it is it's really just like this event right here. And it's sort of like church. You've been to church, and you sit at church, and then as soon as the benediction is given, you get up and you beeline straight to your car. <laughs> and then you get in the parking lot, and somebody asks you, uh, you like, church was really good. And they ask you, well, what was it about? I don't know, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> because you're not like exposing yourself to the opportunity and positioning yourself to, so that someone can actually see you and actually be have a chance to talk to you. And because you are so accustomed to your routine, that's what's keeping you stuck in the positions that you're actually in. Number two is this, and I think it goes to what Emily was saying. It's this thing that I've been talking about a lot, and it's called emotional impotence. And it ain't sexual, but it's, it sounds like it. <laughs> but what, what emotional impotence is basically suggesting that are you open enough? Are you vulnerable enough? Do you, are you allowing people in or are you going in and do you have a stone cold face every single day and you're just there to do exactly what you do? People get that energy, they get that vibe. And if you're not open enough for people to actually come into your world, people don't want you in their world. So if you want to advance your career, you have to have a level of emotional openness that says, hey, I'm here, I'm ready, I'm available, and I wanna be a part of whatever it is that you're doing. Yeah, I think what you all are alluding to, uh, are you saying that there's, a, the, there's politics involved? Oh, absolutely. Right? Because a lot of times we don't like to play politics. And I can kind of feel the vibe of the audience. Some people don't have supportive managers. They have some managers that are absolutely unsupportive, and they're aligned with a whole other skill set. It may be because of color, or race, or gender, or just connections that advance that, that they had before you got there. You're not part of the network. Uh, what should someone do to get in with um, their manager or other managers to move up if they're not in a supportive uh, dynamic at work? I'm going to share one thing. All right. So I, 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 learned, I learned by just chance. Okay, I learned two things, all right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, my wife and I used to live in a predominantly uh, non-African American uh, neighborhood. Mm -hmm. No one would speak to us until we got a dog. <laughs> And we got a dog. Hey, buddy, how you doing? What's going on? How you doing? What's your name? I'm like, we've been living here two years. And, 
and, and getting a dog, getting a dog uh, allowed people to speak to me. But what I realized, they needed something to relate to. That was an iceberg. They needed something yeah. to, re to relate to. Yeah. All right. And so another one that I've noticed that just worked by chance is that I'm a proud Michigan Wolverine. All right. And whenever I go on vacation, I wear my Michigan hat. And people come on, good, go blue, go blue. Even Ohio State fans, as terrible as they are, you know, will say, hey, yeah, we whooped your, we whooped your tail. But what it does is it's a conversation icebreaker right. that, that, that is above my skin color or above my gender or above me being connected. Yeah. All right. What, what tips do you all have in breaking the ice and, 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 and infiltrating new markets? I, I think people, to what Dr. Tart was saying, people like people who believe what they believe. And whether it's a dog, whether it's a hat, whether it's a team or something, try to get into circles with people who believe what you believe. And I know sometimes it, your manager doesn't believe what you believe. Uh, I have a really different stance on this because I would actually tell you to go out and do your own thing. But we're going to talk about it because y'all got jobs right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> but don't be afraid to launch out and do your own thing either. But if that's not something that you're actually going to do or that you're willing to do, I would tell you that. Try to align yourself with people who believe what you believe. And if they don't believe what you believe, find something about them that you do believe so that they believe and you can actually relate to them. Yeah. I've actually been in, in circumstances, uh, when, especially when I was in automotive, that I could not find anything in common. Um, mm. I'm a huge football fan. They were hockey fans. Um, in some diverse areas, this was rural California, which gets very much similar, very akin to rural Mississippi, it's very much the same. Um, but what was impactful for me uh, was essentially, I called it my board of advisors. I, I developed a network of people that could advocate for me that was more closely to the, cir more close to the circles that they uh, would have similar belief systems with. So I had coworkers um, who were high performers and I was brand new in my field. I, met, I shadowed them a lot. I let them uh, shadow my calls, things like that, and let them get familiar with my work and uh, had advocates on my behalf that knew that I was strong in my field and had them accompany me to my meetings so they could introduce me as somebody who was knowledgeable. Um, and I built systems like that, not just on my coworkers, but on uh, uh, cross-functional teams, people who would have more influence in those spaces. So if you're not able to create that system of similar beliefs even within your one channel, just finding those periphery channels that could be advocates for you, I think is important. Yes, some allies. I mean, yes, okay. allies yeah, want to join Yeah, my, my thought would be similar. I mean, um, like I think about, you know, with the firm that I'm with now, I had a couple friends that worked there prior to, and they tell me, well, Daryl, you know, you're the CEO of the practice, he's a, He's a big Georgia Bulldog fan. I'm a big Georgia Bulldog fan. So we, we Go get dogs. to. Even though they lost so to Alabama. We get to. <laughs> I'm from Georgia. It's okay. I heard with you. So, so yeah. half, halfway through my, my process of, of interviewing with him, you know, I, bring up, uh, I bring up that I'm a Georgia fan. And, you know, and so we start talking about it. And then I start talking about recruiting. He just couldn't believe all the stuff I knew about recruiting. And we talked. And, we kind of got off track. We talked football for about 30 minutes. He was like, oh, yeah, we're interviewing. And we kind of got back to it. But that was a connecting point with him. And I think, you know, when you are, you know, in larger organizations and, you know, when you have your, your, your colleagues that you work a little bit closer with and maybe not as, you may not work as closely with your managers and you're new to that, that setting, you know, it's good to, um, you know, build that rapport with your colleagues and then, you know, find out, well, what is the boss, what's, what's my manager like, you know, what are some things that, you know, I, I could do or make mention of that, you know, build, that would build that relationship. And so I think, you know, that, I just want to echo what they said. I mean, that, that's, I think that's the best way to go about it. Okay. So what I hear you all saying is that you have to take the action to the people you want to connect with. You can't wait for them to come to you. A lot of times you might be at a disadvantage and the people that I know that have made a career out of relationships they know how to navigate in a variety of settings let's talk about networking up let's talk about networking up how do you get to upper management how do you get to the CEOs how do you get to the decision makers and I'm Emily I really want you to um, talk about this online because I, I don't know about you all I, I want to know specifically what to say in that box 
when I don't have any contacts yeah. and I have to leave a quick message. Yeah. I want to know what to say to, to make that connection. Yeah. I'll start with I, I think being extremely informed is going to be very important. Uh, at LinkedIn, uh, one of our key phrases is relationships matter. Uh, and I'm sure you are all very familiar with the phrase, your network is your net worth. Um, so leveraging any second degree connection, any of those shared, uh, shared uh, circles or experiences is going to be highly important. And you usually only have one shot, right? You send that one, I'll use an in-mail or a LinkedIn message for, as an example. Uh, you have one subject line, one body, one send button to, to get that, that, that way into a relationship. And so I think what's been most impactful for me, the clients with whom I work, is really highlighting what that connective tissue is between you and this person that you're trying to reach. So having a really punchy subject line that, that calls attention, like, like go dogs, or something else that shows, hey, we have something in common, uh, if they're alumni of Georgia Tech or wherever. Um, in, that sub, or in that body, uh, we have a one thumb rule. If they can't read the entire message with one scroll of their thumb, they're not going to read it at all. That's good. Um, so I failed already. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, and in the, the body of that message, having a really punchy subject line, um, in that first paragraph, identifying what that connective tissue is, hey, we both know Charmaine, she's wonderful, blah, 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 she's told me all about you and how we might have something in common. This is the impact that I think our relationship would deliver. Do you have time to meet over coffee next week, blah, blah, blah. Just having a distinct call to action, um, I think is going to be your, your best bet. Um, and it, even outside of the sphere of email and LinkedIn messages or what have you, heavily leveraging your network and the relationships that you have to, to make those acquaintances is going to be super important because we all operate in networks of trust, at, in the, especially at such a time as this. Okay.